So we are going to talk about imposter syndrome, and that was a wonderful introduction. She gave us a very clear example of her own struggles, but we want to hear from our guests now. Uh, what is imposter syndrome, and how have you experienced that in your campus life, in your, in your colleagues, students, however way you want to um, share it with us? Why don't we? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you saw how she did that. <laughs> um, my name is Nancy Hill, of course. And um, imposter syndrome is when, you know, as I see it, is when you're fully qualified and capable. And you are in exactly what you should be doing. And you doubt yourself. It's not like a false humility. It's, it's when you really should be there and you doubt whether you belong. You doubt whether or not this is right for you. You feel all of your insecurities and you see no insecurities in those around you. And you know, in my own life, I regularly feel imposter syndrome. In fact, um, just two weeks ago, <laughs> I, um, I uh, am just finishing up a presidency of the Society for Research and Child Development, which is the big professional association for people who study children's development. And um, the conference was two weeks ago. And there are 5,000 people at the conference. They're like all the people that are in my field. And I had to do this crazy thing. I had to give the presidential address. And of course I was nervous. Of course, I had no idea what I was going to say. But more than that, I looked at my body of work as your presidential address, you're supposed to talk about the research you've done over the course of your career and, and what have you. And I looked at the body of my research, I went back and read some of my old papers. I looked at all of it and I said, I don't know if this is good enough. I don't know, I mean, how can I spin what I've done so that I look like someone else's work, that it looks better than it is. And when I look at my own work, my own publications, I can, even when they're in the top journals, I, can, I know all the holes. Nobody has perfect data, and I can tell you how imperfect my data are. And I just felt like I, I'm not ready and I'm not good enough to give this talk. And I went to a, one of my colleagues who was organizing the conference, and I'm like, you know, can I just like talk to you about this? And I laid it out to her, what I was feeling, and she knows my work. And she grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me. And she said, Nancy, <laughs> you're a Harvard professor, you were elected president of this organization, and you're gonna give this address, and it's gonna be great, by the way. I mean, you don't know if it's gonna be great because you haven't even seen the outline. No, it's gonna be great. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, there's no logical reason why I shouldn't be able to give this talk. And that was just two weeks ago. And you know, it starts early and, it's, and it stays with me. And getting over it is, is sometimes just going and asking a friend and having them like shake you, smack, knock your, get out of it, you know. And um, so anyway, uh, it's, it, it's, for me, it's real. And I, and I often feel it, I often doubt, even though when, you know, I'm fully capable without being arrogant, I mean, I'm qualified but I doubt those qualifications at times. So that's what it has looked like for me just in the last couple of weeks. I'll, uh, I'll bring it home. I think imposter syndrome is um, when you got accepted to NYU. NYU currently has an 8% acceptance rate and you still think, why did they let me in? And from the perspective of all of the admissions officers, they would tell you, they let you in because you are extraordinary, every single one of you. And yet, this is, this is so prevalent. Um, I think I've had a, a big evolution in my, my own experiences of imposter syndrome. Um, I, it was at its height when I first came here as a young assistant professor. And um, if you don't know, um, what you do when you get a job as an assistant professor is you work really, really, really hard. You have six years to convince all your colleagues that you are the best in the world, and if you don't, you get fired. So no big deal, right? So like, no big deal. No pressure. No pressure at all. 
And I mean, that was the time, yes, lots of hard work. Am I going to make it? I don't know. You start looking for the stories that, oh, everybody thought that she was going to make it, but no, she didn't make it to tenure. We don't know why. And then so many others that it's just obvious. And, um, you know, I went through that and, 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 and got tenure. And the thing that helped me most was when um, on my second sabbatical, I decided I wanted to do a startup company. And when you do a startup company, you have to pitch your idea to uh, investors that have lots and lots of money. And you have to convince them that you can do it. And I had, I had business partners. And I would hear them talk about me. And I'm like, are you, are you talking about me? And then they weren't there, and I had to do it. And I got really good at it. And I realized that, that that is such a powerful thing to be able to present yourself in that way. It is truthful. All I said was the truth. But I had never been taught to, to speak that way about myself as an academic. As an academic, you never, there's no superlatives. We're, we're trying, we're, we're testing it out, we're still looking at the hypothesis. And that was a really, that was a real turning point for me. And um, I, if, if uh, uh, I, I became dean just in September, and I'm thinking about a new course on you know, pitching yourself. How, how do you pitch for yourself? Uh, because it, it was truly a turning point for me. So. Thank you so much for sharing such personal experiences. But I think all of us uh, can relate that if professionals in their level are uh, struggling this way with imposter syndrome, how much more to, to our students in the real world. Let's maybe take a step back and hear about the very um, early stages before you were as accomplished as now. Uh, maybe take some years back, right? When you were first feeling this way as a young person. So um, just to give you an example, uh, in my clinical uh, counseling, I have met an 11-year-old who said, I have imposter syndrome. So that's how <laughs> real it is and how young uh, we're recognizing uh, this problem. And maybe maybe think back to your you know, late teens or early 20s. Yeah, so um, I would say that it was, you know, I've had kind of cyclic. It, it was bad in high school. Didn't know what. I was doing and, and uh, didn't have a direction, didn't know what, um, what was what. It got much better when I got to college because I, the very first day of my freshman year, I walked into a freshman seminar class, you know, just 15 students or so, with a full professor. She happened to be a neuroscientist and the title of her talk was The Brain and Its Potential. And she came, um, she came to class. Well, first of all, she, she kind of looked like a neuroscientific Beyonce at the front of the classroom. <laughs> I mean, she was like, she was powerful, but in a very friendly way. And she had um, very strikingly this hat box. It was a flowered hat box on the table in front of her. And as she started to tell us about um, the, the fact that the human brain that we all have in our head. I'm not talking about Einstein's brain or Marie Curie's brain. I'm talking about our brain is literally the most complex structure known to humankind. That it, it defines how we see and think and feel and, and laugh about the world. And as she did that, she dramatically opened that hat box and with her gloved hands, she pulled out a real preserved human brain. And we went, <gasps> I mean, none of us had seen that. Oh my God. And it was just so striking. But the thing that made me want to become a neuroscientist that day was the studies that she talked about that she had done um, in the 1960s, right there at UC Berkeley, where I was a, a student, where she showed for the first time the adult brain, it was an adult rodent brain, could actually change and grow in response 
to the environment. She put them in what she called enriched environments, which was um, kind of like the Disney World of rat cages. Big old rat cage, lots of toys, lots of other rats to play with. And she compared those brains to, to brains that were raised in smaller environments, maybe one other rat, uh, no toys. The brains actually grew. The outer covering actually grew. And I thought, that's brain plasticity. She, she discovered brain plasticity. Oh my God. I want to be a neuroscient. I want to be a neuroscientific Beyonce, just like her, <laughs> and and having that role model helped me in the next phase. Um, and I'm going to stop there, except to say that in September, when I welcomed uh, the incoming freshman class in the College of Arts and Science. I had my own hat box on the stage and I pulled out my own human brain. So it stayed with me all of these years. I love that. <laughs> does she know the potential, the impact she had on you? Oh, yes. Oh, good. Yeah, she <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, when I, 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 um, I don't remember it so, uh, imposter syndrome so much when I was in, an adolescent. And I think it was because my parents were relentless. Um, they were relentless about us belonging. Because imposter syndrome is really about feeling like you belong, like you fit, like this place is made for me and I am made for it. And um, as an African-American woman growing up in a predominantly Jewish and white community, my parents were relentless. You belong, you fit. You're smart, and you're going to work hard because we do math in the summertime. <laughs> and, so the, and so all through high school, I had all of these messages from my parents that I was good enough, that I fit, that I belonged, that I was smart, that I was hardworking. And it wasn't until I got to graduate school that I really felt like, oh, there are people who are really smart. <laughs> My parents' messages did not prepare me. <laughs> because your parents always think you're smart. I think my own kids are smart. I don't know if they are or not. I think they are. <laughs> and I, you know, so I, when, I, when I got to graduate school, that's when it, when it really hit me, when you know, the work was really hard. And the stakes were high because I had an ego investment. That it's one thing when I was an undergrad and I was taking all kinds of courses. I wanted to be a psychologist when I was in middle school. Um, I wanted to study values. I wanted to study how to understand why people believe the things that they do, how people can be convinced of something that they don't believe. How do we, you know, what kind of evidence do we need that will cause us to change our minds? How do we pursue that information in ways to really understand whether or not what we believe is worth believing? And I'm the youngest of, of eight, and so I had all these older siblings to like watch and observe and watch my parents interact with them. And they got all the messages before I got all the messages. So I got hand-me-down messages. <laughs> but again, because the ego investment was high, that I was in a psychology PhD program, and it's all I ever wanted to do. And so since my identity was connected to it, my ego was connected to it, imposter syndrome was all about telling me I wasn't good enough. And it hurt most because I knew if I really wasn't good enough, I had no idea what else I was gonna do, because this was it. I didn't have the brain come out of the box. <laughs> I want a brain to come out of the box. I didn't have that. <laughs> I had all these siblings and, <laughs> and, and our parents and their, their, their relentless uh, um, socialization of who we were and what, what mattered about us. And so when I think about that, it draws me, uh, you know, I've been studying psychology for a long time. I took enough psychology courses in undergrad to double major. Nobody told me I should take something else. And so I took them all. I took all the courses I could take. And, um, and I'm a developmental psychologist, but I'm, cl I'm a closet social psychologist. And I love the social psychologists because they like to experiment on people and they like to put people in conditions and, and manipulate them. And doesn't that sound like fun? They, they clear it off afterwards, right? They, they, they bring you back to Hall. <laughs> but anyway, one of the, you know, there's this, this theory called um, social comparison theory. And it's really at the heart of imposter syndrome that we relentlessly compare ourselves to, to each other. 
you know, think of me, you walked in the room, where am I going to sit? What will people think if I sit in the front versus the back? Who am I sitting next to? What am I wearing? And what am I wearing good enough? How much, you know, all of these things. And, um, and what it, there was a study that came out in 2018 that did a meta-analysis, so a study of all the studies in 2018. They did the meta-analysis on social comparison theory for the last 60 years, all the studies. And they found, th they found a couple of things. They looked at, do we compare up or do we compare down? Right? And if we compare down, we tend to feel better about ourselves. This is terrible. Let's just be honest with our, you know. We compare down to make ourselves feel better. And it's true. When we, when we compare to people that we think we're better than, we terribly so feel better about ourselves. But when we compare up, we can either assimilate and feel like we are as good as the people who we think are better than us, or we can compare contrast and look at those that we think are better than us. And then we measure ourselves less. And it turns out, out of all of these studies, when people had choices between comparing up or comparing down, comparing up, was, it makes us feel worse about ourselves. Comparing down makes us feel better about ourselves. That's clear. 75% of the comparisons that were made in all of the studies in the past 60 years compared up, compared up with a contrast, which means that every three out of four times, we're going to compare ourselves to someone we think is better than us, and we are going to negatively evaluate ourselves in the process. It's, it's prevalent. We all do it, whether it's hair color or something that really matters, like Am I good enough to be in the psychology program? And that's when I first really experienced it was in graduate school. And when I was at Duke as an assistant professor, same process, six years to prove yourself, um, up or, or out. Go. Or go. Yeah, up or out. <laughs> um, and um, they didn't call it imposter syndrome back at, when I was at Duke. They called it effortless perfection. That sounds better, actually. Actually, it's not. <laughs> I actually They're think it's bad, worse. But, but I think it's actually worse. <laughs> so I have to be the best, compare up and assimilate and think I actually am comparing up and am good enough. And I have to do it without looking like I put any effort into it. Uh, and that's what it was called when and a lot of the women at Duke really suffered from effortless perfection. And it came out in ways around you know, how they felt about their bodies, their body image, how many calories they were eating. You know, it's parenting when, probably parenting as problems. an academic. Yes. Very, very challenging. Yes. Wendy, you were commenting on the fact that Duke is so beautiful. It's a okay. beautiful campus. Yeah. The fact that they pull out live good flowers and put in new flowers just because, because the campus looks perfect, which makes the women feel like they have to be perfect. And there was this whole study done uh, on the Duke campus around effortless perfection and imposter syndrome. I, I'm just going to add on here. Uh, you made me remember probably the hardest um, decision I've ever made as an academic, which is, I think it's internal comparison that I did, but you can tell me which category it should be. And this was when I was, um, I was full professor. I'd just been uh, um, uh, uh, promoted to full professor uh, studying the neurophysiology of memory and how cells in the hippocampus, part of the brain, um, respond as you form new memories. I had been done, doing that for 25 years. I studied the anatomy, the physiology, the behavior. I was an expert. I was at the top of my field. I was full professor. But I got interested in something else. I got interested in something else because that seven years of getting tenure, uh, I, gained, I gained 25 pounds, I had no friends, and I was at a kind of a low point. Um, and uh, I knew I had to do something. And uh, at the end of that time, I did get tenure, um, I went to the gym to, to get myself back in shape because I ate way too much takeout here in Greenwich Village. And um, uh, so I started feeling much better, much better. Made new friends at the gym, it was great. Um, but I, I noticed one day, writing my NIH grant, 
that writing was going well. And I'd never thought that to myself ever before in my entire career. And um, I, uh, writing was going well. I seemed to be able to remember better. My mood was good. What was going on? And I realized the only big change I'd made in my life was regular exercise, going to the gym. Um, and, and not eating takeout, but I, I was betting on the, on the gym stuff. And um, It's New York, after all. Yeah. <laughs> and so I started to look at what is the effect of, of the exercise on the brain. And there were so many studies coming out about the effects on mood, about the effects on your ability to shift and focus your attention. And how interesting. Let me, let me just dabble in this a little bit. You know, I'm doing, I'm these, doing these studies um, in my lab, but, but let, me, let me start with the class. So I, I, I taught this class called Can Exercise Change Your Brain? And um, I ended up um, becoming a certified exercise instructor so I could bring exercise into the classroom. And then I uh, decided to test my students at the beginning at the end of the semester to see if my exercise that we were doing together would change their function and their brain function, which it did. It, it uh, absolutely improved their, their motor um, response times. And I realized I was... I was waking up thinking about the exercise studies that I might do for fun on the side more than I was thinking about the other studies that I was doing. And, um, and I said, well, I, I just ignored that. But one day, I thought, could I change? Could I actually change my research program? I thought, no, you're well known. You are the memory hippocampal lady. You can't be the exercise lady. It's too late. You're a full professor. <laughs> and the comparison was internal because I knew how long it took me to get. I was, I was up here, and I was going to put myself way down here. I didn't even know this field very well. I was playing around in my undergraduate classroom for these studies. And I had to decide. These were animal studies that I was doing. If I shut down my lab, there was no going back. I'm not getting that animal lab back ever again in my career. And it took me a long time. And, and could, I, could I do it? But I had no choice, because I was waking up thinking about the exercise studies I wanted to do. But that was the hardest decision I ever made, because the comparison was with me. Could I get back to anything close to that? And, and because if I didn't, I wouldn't be satisfied. But I had no choice in the end. And, um, those studies, the studies that I ended up doing on exercise uh, are, are some of the most satisfying studies that I've done, and I'm kind of bringing that to the deanship, because now I have 9,000 students in the College of Arts and Science, so. And she's gonna make them exercise. I'm make them exercise <laughs> one way or the other. But that was the hardest decision I ever made in my, in my academic career. I'm loving this conversation because without me having to ask what causes imposter syndrome, Nancy has smoothly answered, and then uh, Wendy touched upon solution already, so we're gonna move right into then how can we help ourselves get out of this imposter syndrome? So let's move on to solution parts. Um, how are we dealing with it and how can we deal with it? I think part of dealing with it is just knowing that it exists mm. and being able to see when it happens so that you can predict it. You can predict it. And then once you know, you're like, listen, self, I'm not going to be duped by this again. And then, and really, you know, it, it's not being prideful. It's being honest with, with what you're gifted to do and, and your sense of purpose. And you know, one of the things that I, I always remember, I do a lot of research on sense of purpose and the transition to adulthood and, and how um, adolescents and young adults kind of find their place in the world. And, and I, I love uh, Bill Damon's definition of purpose. It's, it's something that is meaningful to the self, but contributes to society. And so in many ways, we can say, oh, I'm good at this, or I like this, or, you know, I'm interested in this. It becomes all, you know, internally focused. But purpose actually put, takes what we're good at, you know, what you're good at, your talents, your gifts, your strengths, and contributes to society and, and makes society better. 
And in so many ways, it's understanding. It's not that you're going to do everything well. You know, what is it that, that, that lights you up? What gets you up in the morning, keeps you up at night? What are the problems that, that just upset you or in, inspire you that you really feel like you can make a difference? And then remember that you don't have to do everything, but that's the thing. And that's what you're meant to do and your ways in which you can contribute to society. And in some ways, no one else can do it but you. And so the community is counting on you and remembering how much the community is counting on you doing what you are gifted and talented to do. And you know, I, I, I think we have to talk to people and have people who will hold us accountable to the gifts that we bring. And again, it's not like, oh, I have to be good at everything. You don't have to be good at everything. But each of us knows some of the things that light us up. You know, what are the things that we feel like we should really challenge ourselves to get better, that we can get better? And it's when we are steeped in our sense of purpose is when imposter syndrome arises. Because we're, our ego is invested in it. We feel like we should do it. We kind of believe that we can do it. And so imposter syndrome often leads to inaction. We get frozen. We stop doing it because if I don't do it, then at least I haven't failed doing it. And we have this kind of fear of failure that comes with this imposter syndrome, that if we, if we just back away from it, then I don't have to admit that I was afraid to do it. And so imposter syndrome leads to inaction. And if we know that, we don't have to solve the whole thing. We just have to take two steps into it. And for me, imposter syndrome, as you know, I just had it two weeks ago, it never goes away. <laughs> and no matter how many times I accomplish something, I think, oh, if I you know, just get my PhD, or if I just get the job, or if I just get tenure, or if I just get, you know, if I just, and it stays right out ahead. I've never been able to pass it which means I have to kick it out of the way. And doing that is, is remembering, you know, what is it that I'm good at? What are the contributions that I bring? Where do I get that feedback from my community that reminds me why I'm a valued member of the communities in which, in which I walk? And so it's about belonging, and it's about staying actively engaged in, in your, your gifts and your talent and, and your purpose. That's beautiful. I love that. I'm going to offer three ideas. And the idea, number one, comes from what Nancy and I have said. You need a friend like Nancy to shake you and say, you are amazing. Mm -hmm. just, just realize it. And a friend like mine who, who told me about myself in a way that I never would have said myself. But I took that, and I used that, and I internalized that. And that was such a powerful gift. That is number one. Find that person that will do that for you because um, it's, it's a lesson and, and keep building on that. Point number two comes from my research on exercise and general well-being. We are our most creative selves when we are feel good, we get enough sleep. How many people feel like they got enough sleep last night? Okay, some. Get enough sleep. Move your body. Did you know that just 10 minutes of walking can significantly decrease your feelings of anxiety and depression? Just 10 minutes. We walk 10 minutes just to get to the subway, just to get to the next class. That is, that is a gift that we have. Make sure that you're giving your body and your brain those gifts so you get into that creative slot. And the third uh, uh, gift that I'll offer is something that um, the uh, amazing uh, musician Jacob Collier, I heard him say that uh, he was being asked about imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And he said that when you are you're the biggest boldest version of yourself. You lift everybody else around you up. You inspire them. You help them be big and bold and creative as well. And I just loved that inspiration. 
So, um, uh, and, and I agree with him. And I try to remember that, even in situations where you get scared and you think, oh God, I'm not gonna be able to give this talk. Um, but you, you're, you're bringing everybody with you. And I tell you, you can feel it when you do. So it's very clear there's a mind-body connection here with imposter syndrome. How about our spirit? How about your faith or your worldview? How did that offer any solutions to overcoming imposter syndrome? Well, I'm a Christian, and um, I believed in God since I was a little girl. Um, I wouldn't even necessarily say I was a Christian since I was a little girl, even though uh, I was raised in the church, but I always knew that there was a power bigger than me. And then that, got, that power got named in the context of, of my, my faith as a, as a Christian. And, and what I love about, uh, about how the Bible talks about this is that we don't have to do anything for God to love us. That it's not about what we've accomplished. It's not about our resume. That we get that love for free. And if I don't have to work to be loved, then all else is secondary, right? And so when I think about how Christ loves me, he didn't ask me to do anything for it. And so it means I don't have to do anything to be loved. And if, and if being loved and being understood and being created, nothing else really matters after that. And I, and I um, you know, the Bible talks a lot about purpose. And when I study it as a psychologist, the Bible talks about it uh, as well. And, you know, we're, we're given gifts and talent and purpose and we're also equipped to do the things that we're called to do. And God's, the Bible says that God doesn't leave us alone, that he will be with us. He will hold us upright in his righteous right hand, it says in, in Isaiah 41, that he won't leave us. And if I'm going to be loved and never left and upheld by a righteous right hand, what else matters? And so that's what it means to me. I spend a lot of time thinking about purpose as, as, as adolescents and young adults find their place in the world. But then I'm reminded that we were designed and we were given gifts and talents and we were given a purpose and no one asked us to do anything to belong. And that's how it kind of it gets interwoven for me. It's just remembering just, you know, we are beautifully and wonderfully made. And, you know, I look at all the human beings that I love to look, I love adolescents and all the ways in which they're, they're quirky and funny and insecure and figuring themselves out. And they all want to be different and so they're different in the same way. So they all wear the same clothes because they think they're all being different, right? <laughs> and, you know, but each of them has a spark inside of them. And, it gives me deep joy to try to capture that spark and fan it into a flame. It says in Proverbs that the purpose of one's heart is a deep well, and one with insight can draw it out. And so I'm constantly looking for the person that can bring insight. We've talked about mentors. We've talked about people who will shake us into it. <laughs> and, and in my work, you know, we, with uh, young adults, we, we talk about mentorship and we have kind of a mentorship model. And, and we've talked about one of the types, which is mirrors, which is someone who will affirm who you are. We hold up a mirror to you and affirm and remind you when you doubt. And the second one is, is, is windows. You need a mentor who's a window. And the window is the mentor is the one that stands beside you and looks out on the horizon and helps you imagine how your gifts and talents can be used in the world. And what often happens to, in college, at least with the college students that we study, is that they get all excited when they came in, they, wrote, they get admitted, they have the imposter syndrome about being admitted, but they, can't, they got admitted with some ideas. And then something happens along the way and they've They've lost their way, and they end up doing 
a pre-professional program by default. So I don't know what else to do, so I'm going to do pre-law. I don't know what else I'm going to do, so I'm going to do med school. I don't know what else I'm going to do, I'm going to try to get into business school. And all of those paths are perfectly fine, except if you're saying, I don't know what else to do. And it becomes a default. And they talk about, and the people in our research talk about it as the default path. And so the window mentor will keep you off the default path and squarely in your purpose. And then the third mentor type is guiding lights. And these are the people that tell you the way you should go. They tell you how to reach your dreams. How, after they've helped you cultivate them, someone's helped you cultivate them. You need a guiding light that's going to get you off of the, off a of square one when imposter syndrome is high and push you into, into action and out of inaction. And so that's how faith, it's deeply embedded in how I think about purpose and life and my own experience with imposter syndrome. Way back, um, I was giving a, a talk. It was a, um, a commencement address. Um, I wasn't nervous for it the way I was for this talk a couple weeks ago. And I remember talking about them, and I said, you know, when I got, um, was offered a, a faculty position at Harvard as full professor, um, I used to talk about it this way. say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, I kind of slipped in while nobody was looking. And I used to talk about it like that, it, like, oh, yeah, you know, because there are so many people. I'm not as convinced I'm at, I'm at the top of the game the way you're convinced you're at the top of the game. So I, I, I'm learning here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, the top is still way. <laughs> I'm going to borrow some of you. Yes, <laughs> and I just think, like, oh, my gosh, all these people are so much better than me. But I, I was offered this tenure full professor position at Harvard. And I used to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody was looking. And I sl slipped in. And I felt. God convicted me. He just kind of like, what are you talking about? You're qualified. And not only are you qualified, I made sure everybody was looking when you strutted across and got the position. And so you're qualified. But it's like even all these ways that it seeps in, just even in how we explain our own successes, that imposter syndrome slips in. Um, and so those are the, the ways in which faith for me is deeply embedded in both my work and my life and how I experience it and work against imposter syndrome. I would say that one of the things that it's so comforting to me is the idea that everyone everywhere is loved in the same way. It doesn't matter whether you got a 98 or an 86 on your test. We're all loved in the same way. And more than that, we're all worthy in the same way. And I, I think that that idea is so needed, um, despite the fact that it's, it's incredible that we have this admit rate that we have. It causes so much anxiety and so much angst, either when if you don't get in or if you do get in, both ways. But I, I think that coming back to that idea that each and every one of us is, is loved, and I kind of test myself, even the people that I really don't love are loved. And, and can, I, can I extend my, my loving kindness meditation to everybody and, and, um, and, and be more, more godlike, more, you know, do, do what Jesus said that we should do. That is, uh, that is very hard. Um, but I think that it has, it's helped me at all the times when the imposter syndrome has come in. It helped me at that moment that I described for you when I couldn't decide whether I should, I should leave what I had built for so long to something that was completely unknown. And I spent a lot of time meditating, praying about that. And I remember it was halfway between a dream and a, and a vision that I had. It, it, was a, it, it had been a while. I had to make a decision. I, just, I couldn't be in limbo anymore. And I had this vision of myself at the edge of a cliff I'm standing at the edge of a cliff. It's really, really far down there, and I'm at the edge. I needed to make a decision. 
And all of a sudden, a slide appeared. And I sat down on that slide, and I went, wee! <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, OK. God is telling me, my vision is telling me, go for it. You already know the answer. I already knew the answer. That is where I wanted to go. I wanted to go to the fun studies that I was thinking about, waking up every morning. That's what I wanted to do. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it helped at that. It was essential at that really critical moment. Um, due to time, I'm going to ask maybe just an encouraging word um, to finish this portion of our uh, conversation, can you offer an encouragement for our students? Um, because in my, uh, in my therapy, I see a lot of college students actually taking medical leaves mm -hmm. because it wasn't a 98 or even 86, but it was more like a 65. And, you know, I'm sure there's that one student who's still wondering, but how about me? Am I really good enough? You know, just an encouraging word from each of you. I'll, I'll start. Um, um, I taught a lecture on creativity um, on Tuesday for my freshman first year seminar class called How to Build a Big Fat Fluffy Brain. And we, um, and, and I assigned them one of my favorite TED Talks by um, a, a friend of mine, Julie Burstein, who wrote a book called Spark, How Creativity Works. And I, I love this book because it's all about where some of our most creative minds come from. And you know what they come from? They come from the things you think are your biggest faults, your, your difficulties. She talked uh, about a, a Pulitzer Prize winner who grew up with dyslexia, being able to read at one third the speed of everybody else. He was not gonna be able to amount to anything, except for the fact that slowing him down in reading got him to appreciate the rhythm of the language in a way that he then jumped on to write in a way that nobody else did. Nobody else would have thought, oh, this kid with dyslexia won't, you know, they won't, won't amount to anything. Um, the most creative minds in our, in our world today are full of studies of, full of examples of of creativity from loss, creativity from adversity, things that you, you go through, including maybe a leave because you do, but come back, you come back stronger. It changes your direction. It teaches you something. And I love those stories because it reminds us that everything is part of us, which is why we're all loved in the same way. I love that. I love that. I love the story about you know, just the weak, you know, really focusing in on the weaknesses and what we might see as weaknesses might be the very place that are, you know, we find our calling, and we find our purpose. I, I would like to leave you with this. One, that you belong. That you belong. If you weren't here, you would be missed that you matter to the community, that you do have a calling, you do have talents that are uniquely yours that are attached to your calling. You're not designed to pursue your calling alone. We're designed to pursue our calling in community because purpose is about both what's meaningful to self and what contributes to community. And so never doubt that you belong. Go easy on yourself. There's no rush. For so many in the, in the popular press, for you know, adolescence and, and young adulthood, the popular press is brutal. You know, they're taking too long. They're apathetic. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not taking on responsibilities. They're, but that none of that is true. None of that is true. Don't be afraid of taking time to pursue your interests, to pursue your talent, to catch your breath. 
use the time wisely, but doing nothing, I mean like nothing, we're trained to believe that that's wasting time. It's not wasting time. When we're doing nothing is when our brain is really at work solving some of the things that, that, that we want to solve. I get my best ideas at night when I sleep because my brain is continuing to work, hopefully growing. <laughs> um, but, but give yourselves time and make good decisions about how you spend your time. And no, I don't want to do that is a perfectly acceptable answer, as is, yes, I want to do that, but not that. We're so quick to fill up our calendars and fill up our schedules because we're afraid we're going to miss out on something. But if we understand our gifts and our talents and test out our calling, then we can easily say no to things and create time and space for the things that matter, which are relationships, friendships, community, exercise. Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> the thing I, speaking of sleep, the thing you talked about um, coming out of tenure and, and, uh, and, and exercising. Halfway to tenure, I realized I was never going to make it at the pace I had. And I decided that the only way I was going to make it is if I actually trusted in the idea of Sabbath. And I decided I was going to work five days a week really, really hard. The sixth day, I was going to do all the things you have to do, laundry, grocery shopping, cleaning the house, all those things. Because if you're going to do those on a day, you can't call that a Sabbath because that's actually working. And that I was actually going to take a real day off. And I was going to sleep eight hours. And I found if I allowed myself to sleep eight hours, I would wake up in seven and a half hours without an alarm, and I had 30 minutes to contemplate what I dreamt about the night before. That sound, you know, it sounds like, oh, you dreamt about it. I get some of my best ideas out of problems my brain was solving while I was asleep. And those 30 minutes lets me either capture those ideas or laugh about it, or try to remember something, or maybe it was just what I ate last night. Um, but anyway, but just really that kind of self-care. And once I did that, I was writing better. My ideas were clearer. My interpretations of my findings were better. And she's a full tenured professor at Harvard. Oh my god. <laughs> but I'm still not top of my game. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Yes, Next you time you see me, I'm going to be talking like her. <laughs> but that's what I want to leave you with, is, is, is that, is um, the Sabbath. Be kind to yourself. Do this work in community. And remember who you are in the relation to community. And you belong. Maybe a plot together. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, thank you, doctors. Hill and Suzuki for sharing so much of your insight. Thank you, Dr. Jung, for, for moderating such an interesting discussion. Um, I'm, yeah, as somebody who literally wrote a book on imposter syndrome, um, I'm feeling this talk so hard. Um, I want to pick up on something that Dr. Hill, that you said, you know, when you were at Duke and all of these perfect women and this effortless perfection. Um, I see this with my students. Um, I teach creative writing at American University, and I see a lot of my students, especially... Uh, young BIPOC women who, who I, I see the telltale signs of imposter syndrome in my classroom. And I think the conversations that are being had now about imposter syndrome, uh, there was a big Harvard Business Review article that came out two years ago that said, stop telling women we have imposter syndrome. So now I'm, I, in one sense, we have this term to describe this feeling of unease and inadequacy, even though we should deserve our spot at the table. Um, but then now we're telling women, and especially BIPOC women, to stop having it. In the same breath, I have Google alerts for imposter syndrome, and every day I see like Forbes, Entrepreneur, Inc., um, they're all saying, we all have it, or this is how you can harness it in the marketplace. Um, and, and I'm just, I, I myself, as somebody who, who is trying to navigate this moment and hearing these two pulls, and I wondered if, if 
uh, you both could talk a little bit about that and, and try to, as, as we try to arrange, and especially for the, the students here who I think are, are hearing both of these narratives, um, especially the stop having it, but then also we all have it, um, or let's, let's use it. Um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, uh, all of the above, I think, I think it's very common. Um, I think, uh, maybe not all of us have it, but I think it's very, very common. Um, I think that, uh, um, I think we talked about how you can um, kind of shift your mindset away from that way of, of the comparison up. Do not compare up. That is not, that it's not good. Compare, not even compare, but look in and start to appreciate. Mm -hmm. that, that, is, that is one of the solutions that you can use. Um, and I think that, um, um, what was the third one? Don't, <laughs> everybody has it? Oh, stop telling women. Yeah, stop telling women. But I, I do think one of the um, one of the situations that can enhance this feeling of imposter syndrome if is if you don't see enough of you represented where you're going. So for a very long time, women did not see themselves. Today, it's much better, but not perfect. It's not a 50-50 world. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I told that story that very early on in my career, I had a female neuroscientist as my mentor. That was my face of neuroscience. So I did not, I was not worried about, oh, I couldn't do it because I was a woman. Of course I could. But not everybody has that um, uh, in, in physics and engineering and, and um, many of these fields. It's, it's more difficult for women uh, in other fields like nursing or teaching, it's difficult for men. So it's not only one direction, but I think it started in, in, for the women because there, was not, um, there were not those role models uh, in, in so many different professions for a long time. That's what I would say. Yeah, I would add to that. Um, sometimes naming something is helpful. And if naming something helps someone feel like, Oh, I get it now. I now have a name for it. And now that I have a name for it, I can wrap you know, my hand around it and solve it. And I think that's different than telling people they have imposter syndrome or assuming they might have imposter syndrome. I think when we have labels that help us say, oh, my experience is, is not by, I'm not alone in this. You know, it's in our work with, with um, in research with college students, everyone feels like they're the only one that doesn't have it figured out. Everybody else has it figured out. I'm the only one who's floundering. And the fact that so many people feel that, and I think naming the prevalence of it helps people not feel alone. I want to distinguish between um, belonging, like feeling like this place is meant for me or I, it's designed with me in mind, is part of it, but that's a little bit different from imposter syndrome. I can feel like a place wasn't designed with me in mind and I may or may not belong, but I also, that might not mean that I have imposter syndrome, where I feel like I'm not good enough to be here when I actually am. And that's different from belonging. And, and I think for, particularly for uh, people of color, um, it's sometimes hard to feel like you belong, even if you believe you can do it. And I just, I, so I want to, you know, they're overlapping, you know, uh, uh, circles, but that there's a distinction there. And I think for, as a, as a woman of color, sometimes I don't feel like, I belong because the room wasn't designed with me in mind. But sometimes I'll feel that, but that doesn't necessarily mean like, I don't think I deserve to be there. I was the first African American, first person of color to be in, on faculty in the psychology department at Duke, which made me the first person of color to get tenure in the psychology department at Duke. Did I feel like I belonged all the time? 
I did not feel like I belonged all the time. But I could do it. And so I, just, I want to parse those out and make those a little bit different. I think naming it is helpful sometimes. I don't think we should be telling people that or expecting that they have imposter syndrome. We don't want to spread the disease. <laughs> I have one more tool to offer. Uh, it comes from my book, Good Anxiety, where I talk about different gifts that come from your anxiety. And one of those gifts is the gift of empathy. And it works this way. Um, think of something that causes you anxiety. It might be your, your imposter syndrome. Let's say it's that. You know what it feels like. You know what it makes you feel like. You know what it looks like. And the trick is to turn all that knowledge to the outside and see the other people around you. And what you're going to notice is they all have that same, they all feel the same way. And so the gift comes when you reach out and you say, you belong so much. Just a friendly word. How you do? That was a great question you asked. That was a wonderful presentation you gave. Do it to your students. Because you know what else happens when you reach out and you do something compassionate? You get a burst of dopamine in your brain and you feel really good. So that is the gift of empathy and dopamine that comes from your own anxiety about imposter syndrome. Thank you so much. And now we're going to open the floor to our students, starting with Francesca, which is representing the NYU Feminist Society. Um, so yeah, if you want to come up. Hi, I'm Francesca, and as mentioned, I'm the current president of the Feminist Society at NYU, which is a club that seeks to bring together folks who believe in gender equality across campus uh, together and foster conversations about feminism between them. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and time with us tonight. The question I'd like to pose is, how do you think imposter syndrome affects our willingness to step into leadership roles? Yes, I mean, if you, if you have that um, common belief that you're, you're not worthy, uh, you, sh you don't belong there, it does stop you. When you should not be stopped. That's, that's the irony, that's the terrible irony of, of imposter syndrome. You do belong, you have all those qualifications. You belong at that table, you could lead that table which is why it's so important to talk about it and bring it out into the open and, 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 and you know, do a collective shake of everybody around um, to tell them that, that you know, this, is, this is something that you, you can believe in or it's something that you can, um, you can leave behind. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that being in a leadership role, I think, heightens it. And it heightens it because you're now on display. You, you, the spotlight is in some ways on you as a leader. And if you f have imposter syndrome and you feel like even though you're qualified, you might be faking it, that kind of public aspect of it, I think, heightens it. But... All that learning comes from every failure that I have. If I was perfect all the time as dean of the college, I would be, okay, that would be good. I would like that. But still, I would, <laughs> I would, I would lose all that learning of how to deal with this difficult student situation, this tricky faculty situation. We have so much learning that comes from, um, failures and, and you don't get it done. And if you embrace that, rather than say, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed, I, I, I failed at this, it, it normalizes it for everybody else around the table. It's that feeling of being big. You learn from your mistakes. And um, it's, it's, instead of you were in the spotlight for, so every, Move, bad move is going to be uh, um, scrutinized. It's like, I, I'm doing an experiment. I'm seeing what happens. 
Do we get significance on every experiment? No, we don't. Sometimes they fail. You, you change your direction. If you didn't fail, you didn't, wouldn't know what direction to go into. So it's, it's, it's taking a different mindset, I think. But I totally agree that, that that scrutiny that comes when you are the leader and you're making those decisions, you have that final vote, it, it does make it harder. But, but if you embrace the learning that comes from um, not making the right decision, trying, everybody, you know, you had a choice. You could vote this way or that way. I gave it a shot. Is it the end of the world? No, it's not. Did you learn something from it? I hope you did. And if you didn't, then, then you should take another look. So we have very little time left. If you have a question, don't be shy. Um, I just wanted to ask, like you guys talked about a community a lot. I wanted to know, how do you combat or deal with imposter syndrome when you do feel like you have a lack of community? Like having no community and heightens your imposter syndrome, how can you deal with it then? I think that's a great question, and that's something that I'm trying to deal with at uh, as dean to build more community. Um, and so the answer is do stuff that builds community. Um, have more more events like this where there's there's talking and there's there's also interaction with the crowd. Do everything that you can to connect the people that are there with each other, but also with with the speakers, and and that will get you closer and faster to community. Yeah, um, loneliness is ripe on campus. And just because there are, how many students, 56? How many students are at NYU? You said 9,000 in arts and science. Yeah, yeah. 60,000. 60,000 60, students here at NYU. And it's still quite possible to feel alone and feel lonely. And the, you know, you couple that with imposter syndrome, but it's, it's a problem in and of itself. And you know, really focusing on on building community and loneliness, it's it's a tool that tells us we're deficient in, in our social relationships, and we are social beings. And so, you know, an effort and emphasis on on building community is is essential to to survival. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I enjoyed this talk, um, I really appreciated hearing just like from women of color and like just like highlighting the experience. I know in our group, uh, just like one theme that we were talking about was just like, you know, we have our lovely gentlemen here and we were talking about like all of us were able to relate on like imposter syndrome. And then our friend, it's Nico, right? Was like, yeah, I don't really think about that. And it was just like, <laughs> with, like not in a calling out way, but in a calling in way of like, yeah, like we both were like, we all want to feel like that too, Nico. Um, but I just think that, you know, um, yeah, I just think it's really powerful. I just wanted to say thank you. And also, if you have any book suggestions dealing with imposterism, I wrote down the good anxiety because I definitely will be looking. I know I, I wanted to ask you again because I, I missed it. I was trying to write it down. So I wanted to know the title of your book too. She has books down here in the front. I can see them. Okay. Then we'll be selling, she'll be selling them after. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel. Um, I loved the point in your book where you talk about how anxiety, we can use it as our, like our own superpower. And I love that analogy. Mm. So, but thinking about it in the context of imposter syndrome, which for me is like a big form of anxiety for me. Mm. Um, I guess like I'm having trouble like how to frame it that same way where I can like turn it around and use it as like my like superpower in my life to actually like motivate me and drive me instead of like, yeah. like I don't know, you know, like shelling it in or whatever, yeah. Wait, you're the mentor that I met the other yeah, day. Yeah, I am. <laughs> you, you're, you're a mentor. Yeah, you're I already am. doing that. You're helping other students that are, are several years behind you or maybe just one year behind you, that, that is such a powerful action to take to, to you know, bar imposter syndrome because you, you're helping them. You are giving them your knowledge because you know. So I would say just because I remember you and I met you, you're memorable. 
<laughs> it was just last week, right? right. Um, um, keep doing that. Keep doing that. And, and you're, you're, you know, you're already giving back. That, that's part of the empathy. You're using that superpower already. You know, use your tools and, and, and give back because it feels really good, which is part of the reason I'm sure you're doing this, this wonderful mentorship program in, in the college. So that's what I would say. Last call for questions. Raise your hand high. Hi, good evening. Thank you all so much for your talk tonight. Um, my, qu my question is, what words of encouragement do you have for individuals that lie uh, within the identities or at the intersection of people, with, people of color and uh, people with disabilities? Um, oftentimes, especially for those persons that either receive accommodations in the space that they're at or if they are accepted by way of diversity scholarship or something of that um, manner, they feel as though they don't deserve to be there or their accomplishments don't mean the same because they uh, achieved with accommodations um, to help them progress to that level. So when those thoughts seep in or when those factors are also juggled with and um, imposter, syndrome, imposter syndrome is present for those individuals, what words of encouragement do you extend to them? That is such an important point. Um, Having accommodations because of a disability is an equity issue. And people will twist it into it's giving someone an advantage or something like that. And I'll, I'll just be honest. I have a, an older daughter who's 25, and she suffered deeply from anxiety and depression in high school. Um, it, it, she was hospitalized for parts of it. and she had an accommodation that would enable her to deal with her anxiety in class. And enabling her to be able to walk out of the room in, in high school, to be able to get extra time on assignments, to be able to have you know, uh, um, manipulatives and things in class, made it fair. It didn't give her an advantage. It made it fair. And even when she went to college, and now she's in graduate school, and. And you know she's just like, I don't want to use the accommodation. I'm going to try to do this semester and not use my accommodation. I'm like, why? Why are you doing that? <laughs> why are you doing that? Accommodations are an equity issue. And I think that we have to promote that type of language in our, in our offices, our student affairs offices, and in the offices that, that document uh, disabilities and, and accommodations. It's an equity issue. And I'm fierce about that, both with my, my own daughter and, I, and, and with all the students that I interact with you know, in, in my work at, at Harvard. It's an equity issue, and I am fierce about that. It is, it is giving everyone a fair shot. And so I, and, and I, it, you can tell it irritates me when people try to indicate that having some type of an accommodation for a documented disability is somehow advantaging someone. It's keeping everyone in the community so that they can bring their gifts and talents and purpose that gives meaning to their own life and contributes to society. We need everyone. Nothing more to say. That was beautiful. <laughs> Real last question. have it fully formulated yet, but <clears throat> I'm just wondering how would you um, give any advice about dealing with impos imposter syndrome when you don't necessarily know what career you want to go in or what path you're trying to decide in life yeah. and having like a high expectation of needing to decide because you are an institution that like is trying to get a degree in something and you feel like you don't know which way to go in your career paths. Um, and feeling like you're unfit to be in an environment where so, so many people might be sure of themselves? Yeah, that's a great, great question and very well formulated, I might add. Um, <laughs> so I would say that what has helped me in difficult times, as I shared, 
is to bring a sense of play and creativity to the table. If you're so serious, oh, this is, the, this is the decision of my life, you just put so much pressure on yourself. But what if you give yourself time to explore and talk to people? Don't go on the inside. Talk to 10 different people. What is their um, experience? You know what you're going to find? They're all confused, too. They're not sure what... what to do maybe they'll go that way maybe they made the decision because then you know not I don't know what else to do I'll do the pre-law I'll do the pre pre-health but I'm a big proponent of um, of using that sense of playfulness and openness in your thinking in your mind that is where I do my best thinking and um, to bring that to to these important but but very meaningful decisions in your life is so important. And if you learn that skill, you're going to use it over and over and over for the rest of your life. The only thing I would add to that, because I think that's really sage advice, is that we often have different ideas of what college is for. Some people say, I have to have it all figured out so that I could take advantage of college. And other people say, coming to college and not having it all figured out means I can get the best out of college. And I fall in the latter camp. I think the college years are for deep exploration. And people who come in with the blinders on, having it all figured out, and marching straight through, yeah, they get done, and it's great, and they go on with their lives. But in my view, they've missed something. They've missed the, the luxury of having time to let it all go, allow yourself to be deconstructed, and explore anew. And it may be that you come back and you're going to do the same thing you said you were going to do from the start. But now you know for real because you've, you've allowed yourself to explore. And so I wouldn't fret about not having it figured out. I think that's a real advantage in the college years to not have it all figured out. To allow yourself the time and the opportunity to deeply explore. Take courses that you, you would never think of taking. Just because... You're here, and you can. <laughs> and so I, I, I just think exploration is essential in these years. And it's a true gift to, have, to be at a place like NYU, where you have all of these resources and opportunities and great faculty and creative deans and to really explore. And honestly, it'll all work itself out. I promise you. Thank you to our students who posed the question. Thank you.